Uh, man, it's a good, good little turnout tonight. Um, we're going to be in 14. You can go ahead and turn to Revelation 14 and get ready. And uh, we're going to actually be finishing up the chapter. Last time we were together, we, were, we looked at the, just the first five verses of that chapter last time we were together, which dealt um, with a, a complete contrast with what we're going to talk about tonight, which is going to be interesting, I believe. But uh, we'll, we'll uh, go through these verses tonight, verse 6 to verse 20, and uh, I suspect we'll probably get out a little bit early, but I uh, want to give us sufficient time to talk about things. That There's a few little items in here that might need a little bit more discussion than some others, but uh, it should be pretty interesting. You know, I had a, I will say this, uh, you know, with the Edisto Baptist Association, we have uh, most every month, there's a couple of months during the year where we don't meet, but just about every month, the first Monday evening of the month, all the pastors and when they can, pastors and their wives and, and staff can come and uh, we have a monthly meeting, just a fellowship meeting. There's a couple of them that are uh, actual executive committee meetings where you just where we have to do some business, but the rest of them are just for fellowship and we meet at different churches uh, throughout the year. And it's just a good time for us to continue to get to know each other better. And just uh, each time we'll, uh, we'll have a meal together and we'll t- talk about a different topic or different scripture or thing like that. And um, many of you know Timmy Barr over at Pleasant Hill. Uh, he he's usually heads those up and kind of comes up with the subject of discussion for the night. And we were, uh, last time we met... Uh, the first of this, the first part of this month, we were actually talking about a passage in Thessalonians that deals with the end times, and I thought it was really interesting because I told them everybody, hey, well, you know, we're actually studying Revelation on Sunday evening, and it's made for a really neat discussion to hear different people's viewpoints and uh, perspectives on the same scripture and see, well, d- does this mean this, or how does this uh, coincide with? You go back. to Daniel, and you, you see the prophecy there, and how does it all fit together, and what does it mean, and what does it mean for us, and is there any way for us to know the, the time sequence of some of these end times occurrences, and, and it was a really, really good discussion. I was thankful because this is the first time I've ever taught or preached through Revelation, uh, and, and I'm, I've just begun my 18th year of full-time ministry and never until now never taught through revelation i've I've looked at those seven letters you know to the seven churches but as far as going through the book and it's been really uh really informative for me having to struggle with these passages each week and and try to figure out what's going on you know it's been it's been really helpful so i hope i hope it's been good for you all hope you're enjoying walking through this and uh like i said i've never uh, because I've never studied to teach it, I've never really f- settled in on my personal view, what I think all of that means. And so it's been good for me to try to kind of get some more information uh, to lead me in that direction. So uh, tonight, as I said, chapter 14, and we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 20, and this is going to complete this little section in Revelation, which is the seven signs, okay? This is the end of that section, and it's going to point us toward uh, what's coming up next, and that is the seven bowls of the wrath of God, which is the next portion that we'll look at, uh, not next week, but the following week. So uh, let me pray, and uh, we'll get started. Father, I thank you so much for this day. Uh, Thank you for the beautiful weather and opportunity we had to gather this morning and enjoy a good time of worship together. And I pray that you'll give us a study tonight. Help us to, uh, as we read your word, help us to uh, have open minds and open hearts. And I pray you'd help us understand the best we can what's going on and how it affects us and how we can apply these things to our lives today that we might glorify you uh, more and better and even more often. And we make this our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let me read the text for us tonight, Revelation 14, starting in verse 6. And here's what the Bible says. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, 
having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion or the wrath of her immorality. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is unmixed in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. And then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth has become dry. Then he who sat on the cloud cast his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Send forth your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel cast his sickle to the earth. And gathered from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 1600 stadia. Now that, that right there, let me just say, there's a transition taking place here, Okay. Uh, as we draw near to this seven bowls of God's wrath, which is coming up in the the uh, coming up in the next few chapters, the wrath of God at the end of the age, in a contrast to the five verses uh, in chapter fourteen that we looked at last time, we're now moving into this account of God's judgment on those who continue to worship the beast rather than the lamb. It's a, it's a dividing line. Uh, those who, regardless of how many times they've been told, regardless of what they've experienced or what they've seen and heard, they're still resolute in not worshiping Jesus. They're still headed in the direction of the beast, the, the world. Uh, and so here's a question that kind of kind of uh, I was pondering as I was studying this it's, it's just a, a question to consider given this passage of scripture what degree must your eyes be blinded and your heart be hardened or calloused that you would continue to reject the gospel despite continued warnings about wrath and judgment i mean as far as I can remember and as far as I can remember from what I've read in history, church history, uh, it's been the refrain over and over of the church, the chur churches that preach the gospel. It's been the constant message uh, you've heard in, in this passage. Matter of fact, you've heard that, that message 
brimstone, right? That's not a new development, okay? The message of the gospel has always been a message of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, but that's balanced with this message of uh, definite judgment and wrath and punishment for those who turn away from Christ. So it's not only a message of love, it's also a message of judgment. And so I, I remember, it was a play on words, but I remember um, hearing a preacher uh, use this terminology and say that he was literally trying to scare the hell out of someone. Like, literally. Not using it as, as you know, not using that in a off-the-cuff way, but literally trying to scare that out of them that they might turn to the gospel. And while that can be a powerful motivator, uh, a, a more biblical motivation would not be to run away from the judgment of hell, but run toward the love of Jesus. It's a message of love, even though you have to tell the truth, right? You have to tell both sides and, and give a balanced um, presentation of this is what Jesus has done for you because of his love and grace and mercy. And if you choose to reject that free gift, this is the judgment that awaits. You know, you have to tell the truth that there is two sides to that coin. But uh, you, you don't want to try to scare somebody into heaven. You know, that, that's not a gospel presentation. That is a, a manipulation of emotion. Okay, and there's a big difference. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Uh, it, and it's a fine line that preachers, I think, need to, to walk because you have to be truthful. But you... Uh, have to tell the truth on both sides, uh, concentrating, I think, emphasizing even the love of Christ. That, that's the main uh, ingredient of this message of the gospel is the love that Jesus... Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the basis of the gospel. Uh, and so out of... God's holiness and his unwillingness and inability to abide with sin, he sent his son, Jesus, to pay the, the penalty of sin, to reconcile us to himself. That's, that's the message of the gospel, as we talked about some this morning. So this section of Revelation 14 deals with the contrast of what we looked at in the first five verses of chapter 14, which was about uh, the... The lamb, you know, and the, the ones who have not been defiled in, in verse 14, 14, verse 4. Um, those who have kept themselves pure and follow the lamb wherever he goes and have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God. And so then in verse 5, there was no lie fi found in their mouths. They are blameless. So that's, you know, that's a good picture of those who God, whom God has redeemed. And then we get to this passage this week. There's five um, paragraphs technically in the text in the original text so we're going to kind of follow that as a division here uh, actually there's six we're going to kind of put two of them together uh, but we're just going to walk through the text and just try to explain best I can what the text is saying and how we can maybe understand it uh, a little bit better so first of all there's a series of three angels that you see in the text the first angel is found in verses 6 and 7. So John sees this flying, this angel flying through the middle of heaven, and this angel has what the Bible calls an eternal gospel. And it is for everyone. It says, uh, literally, it says, for everyone who sits on the earth, um, those who sit on the earth, and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So this message, the eternal gospel, is for everyone. Now, Listen to the content of the message in verse 7. Fear God and give him glory. I mean, that, that's the gospel, right? Fear God and give him glory. For the time of his judgment has come. And then the second part of the message, worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So the, the two or the three components of this message, this eternal gospel is fear God, give glory to God, and worship God. 
that's what we're called to do, right? We're called to fear God, to worship Him, to give Him glory. And that's the message of this first angel. And right behind this first angel, there is a second angel in verse 8, talking about the fall of Babylon. Now, Babylon signifies the, the city of the world, the system of the world. If you remember back in Genesis, I believe it was Genesis 9, uh, it was either 9 or 11, you remember the, um, the construction of the Tower of Babel? And, and this is when, this was man's first collective effort to rebel against God, to try to build a tower that would reach up to heaven. And you remember what happened? God brought it tumbling down, and the consequence... The languages were confused. That's when all kind of chaos ensued after that. It was the response of God to man's effort to try to get to heaven on his own. And, and by the way, that is a definition of religion. Religion is man's attempt to get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ. And, and it's just not possible. That's why... Uh, I saw a t-shirt one time, I wanted it so bad, and, but Darlene knows that I have uh, way more t-shirts than I need, and so, because uh, every time I see a cool looking t-shirt, oh, I want that, and uh, so this one said, Jesus is not religion, and that's all it said, and I thought, what a great conversation starter, and because some people get offended at that, I'm like, what do you mean, Jesus is not, Jesus is not religion? Jesus is Savior of the world. He, he's the Messiah. He's not a religion. It's a relationship, personal relationship with the Savior, the Redeemer. So more than religion ever could be. But that, that's what Babylon here represents. And the message of this second angel is that Babylon has fallen. Okay, so... That means the, it's, this is symbolic of the way of the world, the way of the beast. So in other words, uh, the, the opposition of God has fallen. Uh, the consequences have finally come home to roost, so to speak. And because what has the great city, the way of the world, what, what's, what's been done by Babylon the great? The Bible says she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of of her immorality. See, in this sense, immorality is a much more broad term than just what we first think of. Well, that's immoral. Uh, this, this is much more broad than that. This is basically, it, it, it includes everything that is in opposition to the way of God. And, you know, I had a good friend, uh, I have a good friend who told me one time, that's the, really the epitome of who Satan is. Whatever God says, it's the opposite of that. It's, it's, it's in direct, everything Satan does, regardless of how subtle or maybe how insignificant it may seem, everything our enemy does to try to throw us off track is always in opposition to what God says to do. And it might seem like it's just a little variation. Oh, it's, that's no big deal. That won't matter, right? You ever, you ever hear that? Nobody will find out. Nobody will care. It's not a big deal. And that's usually somebody trying to give, convince you to do something you know is wrong. But that's what, they, that's what they say. Oh, it's not that big a deal. Everybody's doing it. it don't worry about it. It's that, and that's the problem, right? <laughs> well, that's the problem. Everybody is doing it. That's their problem. They're, everybody's sinning. And we don't need to be doing that. But that's why Babylon has fallen She's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her immorality. Now, th before I t get into this third angel, verse 9, I want to read a couple things. I'll read you one thing, and, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Chuck Colclazier, the author of that book, The Overcomers, I've used this many times in the course of our study here. Here's what he says about these three angels that start out this section. He says, These angelic voices serve as final warnings to those who continue to be the enemies of God and of his Christ. Through the warnings of these three angels, two truths are seen. The first is that God's patience with unrepentant men and women 
is not without limits. Second, those of us who believe are assured that God's justice and righteousness will ultimately win out. That first part of that, that first truth there that he points out, that can be a sobering thought to us. And these three angels are here uh, announcing these messages to the world, especially the, the first angel that that gospel message, that eternal gospel, was for uh, everyone, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. <clears throat> but that first truth there, God's patience is not without limits. You know, I had a, a sweet little lady. We were up in, uh, in the upstate and uh, at a church up there, and we were sitting in a Bible study. We did a, a Wednesday morning Bible study with our senior adults, and um, we were talking in the, in the course of that time one morning, and she, she just kind of matter-of-factly said, you know, God's patience only goes so far. He, he's not going to deal with us forever. He's not going to continue. I mean, he's going to be patient, long-suffering. That's, that's part of his character. And it's going to go for a particular time, but it's not going to go. It's not unlimited. God's not going to mess around forever. You know, even God draws a line and says, all right, and, and, and maybe in words similar to this, uh, you've embarrassed me long enough. No more. And, and that may mean your time on earth is over. That may be his time he's coming back and he's you know, bringing judgment <coughs> to those who have rebelled and glory to those who have followed. And <coughs> excuse me. But that's, uh, at some point, his patience has an end. <coughs> it's not unlimited. And, and God's righteousness and his justice will ultimately win out. Now, this third angel in verse 9 followed the first two, and he says with a loud voice, If... Anyone worships the beast and his image, receives a mark on his forehead. Here's the message. Sin, disobedience, rebellion, all of that has consequences. Every time. It may not be immediate, but it's, it's got consequences. Sin has consequences. So here, this third angel has a message that says, All those who have worshipped the beast or received his mark... They're going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, there's some interesting uh, description here about the wrath of God. You see this image of drinking of the wine of the wrath of God. So you picture a glass. And, and as you know, back in, in biblical times, uh, the reason why this word was chosen and used here, unmixed, that's the literal transmission, uh, translation, you're... Uh, some of your translations may say mixed in full strength or something to that effect. But when you look there in verse 10, drinking of the wine of the wrath of God is literally, literally says, which is unmixed cup of his anger. That, that points to, in biblical time, when they would drink wine, typically it would be diluted with water to lessen the... Uh, the impairment of it it would just be uh, for either you know medicinal use for your stomach or and paul told timothy at one point to use a little wine to help your stomach out and uh but it would be diluted with water okay well this in relationship to god's wrath and his anger says this is not diluted at all it's at full strength the wrath of god is at full strength and those who have rebelled and followed the beast and received his mark worshiped the beast they're going to have to drink the full strength of the wrath of God so that's a bad thing it's a very bad consequence and if that were not enough this is undiluted full strength unmixed then the Bible says they're going to be with fire and brimstone brimstone is burning sulfur that, that's what the image is right here fire and brimstone and it's going to be in the presence of of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now that's confusing uh, just initially, but here's what that looks like. It's almost as if on the entrance to their eternal torment, there's, a pun there's an initial punishment 
on the way to their eternal punishment, if, if you can get that picture in your mind. Because obviously, the holy angels and the Lamb are not going to be in the same place as their eternal punishment. And so as, as an initial uh, consequence of this rebellion, they will be tormented with fire and brimstone and then eternally consigned to hell forever and ever. And that's when you see the very next verse the smoke of their torment goes up, up, forever and ever. And that's a picture of the eternal portion of that. So it's just bad all the way around from beginning to its never-ending time, which uh, ever, forever and ever, the smoke of their torment goes up. And then you see that the Bible says they have no rest day or night. Now, have any of you ever stayed up, stayed awake longer than you intended to? All the time, Charles. <laughs> That's, okay. Have any of you ever stayed up, like, just some crazy amount of time? Like, uh, not just like, well, I stayed up, I pulled an all-nighter, or stayed up all night. Uh, but I'm talking about, like, even more than that. Like, more than hours straight. Okay. Can can you remember how you felt a little bit like your body, your mind, every, just can you ever remember a time when you felt like you were approaching complete exhaustion? Like you couldn't you you just couldn't take no more. You know, it was over it, it, you got to get rest. You got to do something because you have stayed up too long. One time when I was in college. One time. I mean, I pulled all nighters. I remember one night my junior year in college, and all me and I had three roommates, and me and all three of my roommates, we all had some major assignment due the following day, and we were all in different corners working feverishly, trying to get all our work done, and I remember it was like three or four in the morning, we are calling up the radio station, you know, making requests, we're staying up all night, at least play some music that we like, and uh, nobody else was calling at 3.30 in the morning, so th we got to, all our songs got played, like, almost like all, all in a row. And, but we stayed up all night long trying to get all these different projects done and ready for the next day. And, and it was all we could do just to get to class, just to turn in the work that we'd stayed up all night doing. And one, one time, though, the year before that, I remember I woke up and went to class on a Wednesday morning. And I didn't go, asleep, go to sleep again until that Friday night. I, I was just, I was like a zombie. I mean, I, I was, I don't know what, it just, things just happened one after the other. Some of it was schoolwork, some of it was just stupidity. But it was from Wednesday morning, I was up all day Wednesday, and then Wednesday night, all day Thursday, Thursday night, and then Friday, and it went, felt, uh, sometime Friday evening after supper, I just collapsed and, and went and slept all day Saturday. But it was just nonsense. And, and I felt horrible. But you know what? we have in common about any time that's happened to any of us staying up too late you get some rest it's, it's short-lived you know maybe you stay up 24 36 hours but then then you go to sleep you you recuperate eventually you can't make it up but you, you recuperate you know what this says they have no rest day or night forever that's right they have no rest day or night, forever. And, and you know what's going on during those times that they have no rest, day or night? Torment constantly. Just constant torment, never ending, no rest. It's almost unimaginable. But that's the consequence. See, that's, that's the picture that's being painted very clearly for us is that there is a definite consequence for rebellion and disobedience and for worshiping the beast rather than the lamb. There's a consequence for that behavior. And so then when you see verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 12, verse 12, you get to see even a contrast within this moment because you first read verse 12, I'm like, wait a second. We're just talking about the torment of all those who worship the beast or receive the mark. And now, verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? It says, here's the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here's what that means. 
This is why the perseverance of following Jesus is so important. Because you get a clear picture of what it looks like when you don't do that. When you depart from Christ and you uh, give in to the temptation to fail and disobey and just say, I'm not following Jesus, I'm worshiping this beast and this image and I'm receiving this mark and whatever and, and maybe things will be better for me here on earth then. And so John says, here is the perseverance of the saints, the ones who obey the commandments and keep the faith of Jesus. That contrast, and, and uh, Alan Johnson says it this way, he says, while the beast worshipers have their time of rest on the earth, and while the saints are persecuted and martyred on the earth, in the final time of judgment, God will reverse their role. See, the perseverance of the saints means all this time these folks who thought it was better off for them to worship this beast, this image, this, take this mark. Everything's going to flip-flop at the end. And so if you persevere through the hard times, through the challenging times and the trials and the tribulations, the, the reward is at the end. Go back to Hebrews 11 and talk about, read about the, the hall of fame of faith. All those people who, by faith, they did this, and by faith they did this. Shut the mouths of lions, and they put enemy, uh, enemies to flight in wartime. And then it said, and some of them didn't receive their good on earth. But do you remember what it says in Hebrews 11? They were looking forward to their reward. And it wasn't on earth. Their reward's in heaven. And so that perseverance of God's holy ones in verse 12 is so important for that reason. Now I want to I share one thing with you from, um, from this book. You're familiar with C.S. Lewis. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He also wrote several other really, really good books. Uh, Mere Christianity is probably his most famous and he's written several other uh, other books, one called The Great Divorce, one The, the Screw Tape Letters, uh, and this book here called The Problem of Pain. And in this, in this book, I just want to read a, a couple sentences out of here. There's a chapter about hell, and he talks very plainly about how he wishes he could just do away with that whole idea, wishes there was no such thing. L listen to what C.S. Lewis writes in the context of, we're talking about God's wrath and judgment on those who have rebelled and disobeyed, okay? That's the context. Here's what he writes. Some people will not be redeemed. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it were to lay in my power, but it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our, of our Lord's own words. It has always been held up by Christendom and it has the support of reason. If a game is played, it must be possible to lose it. If the happiness of a creature lies in self-surrender, no one can make that surrender but himself though many may help him to make it, and he may refuse. I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully, all will be saved. But my reason would respond, would that be without their will or with their will? If I say without their will, then I at once perceive a contradiction. How can the supreme voluntary act of surrender be involuntary? And if I say with their will, then my reason responds, how if they won't give in? The problem is not simply that of a God who consigns some of his creatures to final ruin. That would be the problem uh, if we were unbelievers. Christianity presents us with something more ambiguous, a God who so full of mercy that he becomes man and dies by torture to avert that final ruin from his creatures, and who yet where the heroic remedy fails seems unwilling or even unable to 
to arrest the ruin by an act of mere power. In other words, God will go as far as he went to save us, but then if we reject that, he's not going to stop us. He says, I said a moment ago that I would pay any price to remove this doctrine. I lied. I could not pay one thousandth of the price that God has already paid to remove the fact. And here's the real problem. There is so much mercy, yet there's still hell. I read that, and I just, I just had to sit there a minute. Because the way he describes that whole idea of eternal punishment, it's hard to fathom the depth of the mercy of God that would send his son to die on a cross for us, to save us from hell. And yet, the truth remains, some people won't receive it they'll reject the offer of mercy and forgiveness and salvation found only in christ and and that's really the consequences here that we're talking about those who have followed and worshiped the beast received the mark worship the image of god's enemies And, and and even after continual warning no, I don't want that. I don't want any part of that. You ever, you ever met anybody like that? that you, you've talked to them about Jesus a hundred times. No, I don't want that. I don't have any interest in that. And this is what awaits. If there is a final rejection at, at their death, this is what awaits them. And remember, we're not trying to scare somebody out of hell. We're trying to love them toward heaven. That, that's the truth, though. And that, and C.S. Lewis, he, he's got to a point where if he could, just, if he could say, no, everybody's going to be saved, that's what he would want to say, but that's just, unfortunately, not reality. Because if you reject Jesus in the gospel, there are consequences. The last two parts of this passage here You've seen three angels, and they have messages to give to to the earth. But then in verse 13, there's someone different. The Son of Man, the Messiah, speaks, and then the Spirit agrees. You see the Messiah, one seated on a cloud with a golden crown, says, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And then uh, then he says, yes, the Spirit says, yes, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. And the Son of Man is seated on a cloud, wearing a golden crown and holding a sharp sickle. Then, as if uh, to um, agree with or to uh, follow the plan set out by God, an angel appears from the cloud, and he cries out with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, who is the Son of Man, And says, send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. The harvest of the earth has become dry or or ripe. And so the, the, the Messiah cast his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And there's, there's, uh, some correlation here between this and this last section and the one that came before it. So I'm going to go ahead and read the last section. And then we kind of see how they all work together. From verse 17 to verse 20, you get a a more clear picture of the wrath of God. And one of the commentators that I read about this, you know, explored several different things for how to view this and what these things mean all together. And from the context and from what we have as far as information in the the text of Scripture, it appears that these are three different images that uh, different views of the same reality of the wrath of God. So when you start with the the first one is the cup of the unmixed wine of the wrath of God, and then the, the next one is what we just read from verse 13 to verse 16 about uh, the son of one like a, like a son of man 
seated on a cloud with a sharp sickle, and he uh, cast his sickle to the earth, and the earth was reaped because the harvest was ripe. And then this final image here, which may be the most, um, I don't know, the most distinct. It says another angel in verse 17 comes out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also has a sharp sickle. And so then another angel who has power over fire comes out from the altar. And he calls a loud voice to the angel holding the sickle and tells that angel to send forth your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. The ripe grapes is the, the image. And this is what's interesting. Let me, read, let me just read this to you so I, don't, so I don't mess up the words. Do you remember the second line of the first verse of the battle hymn of the Republic? He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. All right? Now listen to this. When this last angel takes his sharp sickle and gathers the clusters of the grapes that are ripe on the vine of the earth, look what the Bible says, what, what he does with them. He gathers the vine he throws the grapes into the wine press of God's wrath. And the wine press, it says, was trodden outside the city, except it wasn't wine that came out. It was blood. And, and, and listen, look at, you want to talk about an image. You know how big a horse is? If I'm stand, standing beside a full grown horse, I mean, the, the back of that horse would probably be like right about here. All right, you, you know what the bridle is? Okay? The bridle is the part that comes around the shoulders and the breast and then kind of hooks to the bit that goes to the mouth and then to the reins, okay? So that's up high, shoulder high, okay? This says, when, when the wine press of God's wrath was trodden down outside the city and blood flowed out, it came up to the horse's bridles for a distance, I'll just go ahead and translate it, 181 miles this high. That's significant. That's a, that's a, a mental picture. The blood that flowed out because of the wrath of God on unbelievers, rebellious beast worshipers, and, and I'm not talking about sinners, I'm talking about unrepentant no i don't want any part of jesus i don't want any part of the gospel when the consequences finally were enacted and god's wrath was expressed the blood that flowed out the punishment was this high for 181 miles i mean i, I don't even have a reference point for that that that's a significant picture so, so what are we to do? Now, if that's what that shows us, this, the harvest of the earth, the, the wrath and the judgment of God that will come upon those who have, uh, the Bible says, those who have uh, worshipped the beast or worshipped the image of the beast or received his mark, they are going to drink the wine of the wrath of God. So that, that's a clear connection between the subject of this judgment. Wh who's receiving it? Those who have uh, rebelled and, and turned away from Christ, turned away from the Lamb of God and worshiped the beast instead. That's the ultimate end. That, that, that's the punishment. So, so what are we to do with that? What, how, how are we to take this? Because you, know, you, you study something like this and you try to make sense of it and you try to figure out, okay... I think I see what's happening here, and I see why, because you have, prior to this, the first five verses of chapter 14, we saw the, the, um, 
the, 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 the lamb of the 144,000 on Mount Zion, and it was such a beautiful picture. They sang a new song before the throne, before the living creatures and the elders. No one can learn the song except the 144,000 who have been purchased from the earth. It's talking about redemption and talking about glory. And then you see the other side. Well, what becomes of those who follow the lamb, who follow the beast instead? This is what happens. The wine press of the wrath of God. And, and so when you, when you look at this and then try to, to wrap your head around it, here's what I believe it should, should do for us on a practical level. Because that's what the text says. Okay? That, that takes us to Revelation 14, verse 20, the end of chapter 14. Uh, uh, just a terrible picture of the wrath and judgment of God upon the don't believe i suspect it if we take this to heart and 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 hear it for what it is i I suspect it ought to take um some root in our heart and mind to to where we will have a different maybe a, a an expanded view of the responsibility of evangelism the responsibility of being witnesses for the gospel. Uh, Now, more than ever before. You know, none of us knows when Jesus is coming, right? We know he is, we just don't know when. Uh, And so, all we know is this. It's closer today than it was yesterday. And if, if we wake up in the morning... It's going to be closer tomorrow than it was today. And if this is the truth, if the Bible is true, and this is the result that's coming for those who don't believe and who reject Jesus, what should we be doing? How um, intentional should we be in our witness for the gospel and our willingness to, to engage people in conversation and tell them about Jesus and and express a genuine compassion and concern for for people's souls, where are you going to be? When when Jesus comes back, where do you stand with him? That's the question that we have to be asking ourselves and asking others uh, as we have conversation if, if we're going to be obedient to the Great Commission, and do what Jesus tells us to do, do we see people ultimately like Jesus sees them? Like the the end of Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus looks out on the crowds and he has compassion for them because they're cast down, downtrodden, they look like sheep without a shepherd. And he says to his disciples... The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers into his harvest. Right? That, that's our prayer, but we pray for that. But here's the, the secret. We're also the workers. So we're, here's what we're praying. We're praying for God to send out more workers in, into the harvest which means we're praying for other people to come alongside us because we're already supposed to be involved in it, right? That's that's the hard part. We're not just praying. We're not sitting here and praying, God, send some other people out there in that harvest. That's, That's not what we're praying. We're praying, God, get me out there and bring some other people with me. And I think that's probably... The clearest part that's in view after a text like that is if that's the end that's going to become of those who reject Jesus, then I want to do everything I can to tell more people about Jesus so less and less people come to this end, right? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you. Uh, for your mercy, and I I thank you for folks like C.S. Lewis that would uh, struggle with a text like this and struggle with the idea 
the truth, really, about hell is a real place, just as real as heaven. And there's only uh, one or the other as far as a, a final destination based on uh, whether or not we trust in Jesus. And so because we know that's the truth, we need to be motivated uh, to be telling people about Jesus, to be good, consistent, constant witnesses for the gospel. And so more and more people will hear the truth about Jesus and then you will move in their hearts and they'll respond and receive grace and mercy and forgiveness, salvation and eternal life. And we want to be, we're, we're privileged to be part of that process. So Lord, I pray you would Use us to that end that you will be glorified and many people will come to Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.